Okay. My name is Nicole Vuvalis, and I am the Executive Director of Human Research Protections here at Utah State University. I am working in conjunction with um, the IRB here at Utah State University, the Institutional Review Board, to put on this training series. This is the first time we've tried to do a semester-long training series, so I hope you enjoy it and find it useful, but um, we welcome feedback on that same link that I talked about just a few minutes ago. Uh, and thank you to all of my IRB members who are here today. It's lovely to see your names in the participants panel. Um, the Institutional Review Board here at USU is an independent committee that is charged with the ethical review, revision, and approval of research involving human participants. Members of USU's Institutional Review Board further the university's research mission by prospectively reviewing proposed research, uh, that research which will involve human participants, to ensure that the protection of those participants is present, especially uh, using the Belmont principles of justice, beneficence, and respect for persons. Uh, we work to create a culture of ethical concern and prioritization of research participant interests. And um, part of the role is also compliance with international, indigenous, sovereign, federal, state, local, and university requirements for conducting research with human participants. Our board is made up of primarily faculty. It includes some staff and it includes some community members as well. My primary role is with the Human Research Protection Program. Um, the HRPP is overseen by the Vice President for Research, uh, and that is um, Dr. Lisa Burrow. And um, in, that, in that context, uh, she has um, oversight over the Human Research Protection Program in its entirety. That includes three primary components. One of those is the Human Research Protections Office and the ways in which we interface with the rest of the institution. So if you've ever received a funded award involving human research participants, you have probably been asked by sponsored programs, for example, whether you have IRB approval in place before your award account or index gets set up. That's part of the Human Research Protection Program, ensuring that the institution as a whole is working together and cooperating to ensure that the proper processes are being followed before human research, human subjects research can begin. We work closely with the Institutional Conflict of Interest Office, the Conflict of Interest Office, sponsored programs, and many, many other uh, units at the university to ensure that we are all communicating and providing a structure that prioritizes the protection of research participants. The IRB, I think, is the biggest component of our human research protection program in terms of the ways people interface with it. Um, again, the Institutional Review Board is an independent committee that um, reviews proposed research with living participants according to established ethical standards, policies and procedures, and of course, best practices for involving human participants in research. And then uh, the MVPs of our human research protection program, of course, are our researchers. You all are the folks who are on the ground interfacing with our research participants, ensuring that their experience is one that they should be having and where they are feeling cared for and um, able to engage with you in a way that allows the institution and researchers to learn things. But ultimately, you all are the front lines. You're the folks making sure that our human research participants are having a good experience participating in research most of them anyway, we're about to talk about the bots and the fraudsters. So um, I want to briefly visit about IRB review standards. Uh, it sets the context for some of the ins and outs of what we're going to talk about as we're talking about managing fraudulent responses. Um, so the Utah State University IRB reviews according to two prevailing ethical standards. The first is the Belmont Report. Um, the Belmont Report is so named for the location where uh, a commission came together to establish uh, the appropriate ethical standards for the conduct of human subjects research following um, many historical research abuses coming to light in the 60s and 70s. So those principles outlined in the Belmont Report are respect for persons, justice, and beneficence, and we'll talk a little bit more about how those apply to our current, our current topic in just a moment. And we also review according to 45 CFR 46, known as the common rule. Um, 45 CFR 46 is divided into several sections. Subpart A are general review standards, and C and D um, deal with vulnerable populations. There's a subpart B for pregnant women, although they are no longer considered a vulnerable population. Um, 
And I think even the language that we use around pregnancy is constantly being updated. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a subpart B updated by the feds in the near future. Um, I want to set the stage for that because we're going to talk about uh, where some of these considerations and some of these guiding ethical standards come into play when we're dealing with fraudulent respondents, uh, bots, and other nefarious actors in our online data collection activities. So what are we talking about today? There are a couple of um, widely used definitions of uh, the the types of respondents that we're going to be discussing today. Um, one is individuals, groups, or computer processes participating in online internet or web-based uh, data collection method at a statistically significant level, such that data are or would be measurably distorted. Um, I might add to that definition that uh, they are measurably distorted by inaccurate or falsely represented responses, since I think this definition could also include honest actors. Uh, you could have individuals, for example, who participate in web-based data collection at a statistically significant level. Um, and so I prefer uh, this next definition. Survey respondents who are A, ineligible respondents due to the study specifications, B, take the survey repeatedly to either distort results or take advantage of incentives, and or C, are potentially eligible, but have responded in a way that may challenge the validity of the survey results or noticeably distort the research data. And so those are the types of um, interactions, folks, and processes that we will be discussing primarily today. And so I have a question for some of you. I'm just wondering, um, how many of you have ever worked on a survey that was attacked by bots or fraudulent respondents? Uh, it looks like nearly everyone in the group has already answered, and you're raising your hands, which is awesome. Um, it's Most of you have not. 64% of the folks who are here today say that they have not uh, worked on a survey that was attacked by bots or fraudulent respondents. 36% of you are saying yes. And 0% of you are saying that you suspect it, but you can't prove it, uh, which is interesting because that is a, a very real challenge that we will spend a little bit of time visiting about today. Um, so thanks so much. It's, uh, it's really interesting to see that breakdown. Okay. The IRB's role in managing fraudsters. Why am I having this webinar with you today? Uh, um, when our charge is primarily uh, the ethical review of research before it gets started and uh, along the way to make sure that everything is being carried out as anticipated. Well, there are a few reasons. Um, start with the Belmont principle of respect for persons. When you are engaging in an online data collection effort, it is very important that um, you're identifying these respondents appropriately and that you're crediting honest work as you've committed to at the start of the study. Most studies at USU begin with an informed consent document, uh, whether that's an opt-in or an opt-out or a fully signed dated process. Um, and in that document, we hope you're communicating the circumstances under which you might accept or reject work from online respondents. And so um, identifying those appropriately becomes important in terms of committing to the promises and the commitments that you as a researcher have made at the outset of your study with your research participants. And so crediting honest work becomes important, even if, um, you know, sometimes we are all human and sometimes we make mistakes. And so it can be very difficult to discern between an honest respondent who tried and um, somebody who is there to try to scheme your compensation into their pockets. Oh. The Belmont principle of beneficence uh, requires that researchers do what they can to minimize harm while maximizing benefits. And um, if we're not appropriately identifying fraudsters in our online work, then um, we could be harming our participants in a real way. For example, Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, when you accept or reject work, that goes into that user's ultimate rating. 
and their rating can impact the future work that they are offered. There are people who, believe it or not, make it a living doing human intelligence tasks on Amazon Mechanical Turk. And if their uh, responses are inappropriately rejected, that can negatively impact their ability to continue on doing high-valued work in that space. And of course, we don't want people wasting their time on a survey effort um, that isn't going to work out because it was attacked by bots at such a level that no longer can you use honest and valid participant data. Um, so we we don't want to see wasted time. And so researchers really should be thinking about all that they can do to structure their online effort to be as successful as possible and to avoid um, issues of fraud or bots where it might also impact their honest participants on the whole. Then we have the principle of justice. Um, so ensuring that the requirements for honest and complete work are understood by all participants, and especially those who may have a more difficult time understanding the requirements. Um, for example, if you are conducting a survey in English and you are targeting people for whom English may not be a first language, and they participate with the understanding that they will be compensated, but it's more of a readability issue that their responses were rejected than it is that they were bad actors who were trying to scheme the research team. Um, then denying compensation or credit for that type of work could become a justice issue as well. Flipping over to the common rule, um, the Belmont principle of respect for persons, of course, ties very strongly to um, informed consent processes and allowing people to have the information that they need to know in order to decide whether to continue. But of course, the common rule itself also has a lot of requirements regarding informed consent. Um, and so one of the things that we often have people include in their informed consent processes is ensuring the timely, accurate, and complete payment according to the informed consent promises. And so. Um, if you have information about when and how and under what circumstances payment will be rendered in your informed consent document, then there are common rule considerations for ensuring that those are adhered to. The common rule also requires that the IRB or some, somebody else at the institution, here it's the IRB, be a point of contact that's available for complaints. So if you've uh, run a human subjects research study through our office and you've used our informed consent templates, you know that in the last full heading of your informed consent document, there's a provision that explains that the research has been approved by the Utah State University Institutional Review Board for the protection of human research participants. And if somebody has a bad experience or simply can't reach somebody in the research team or has a concern or complaint, that they can reach out to the IRB. Um, and so we are that contact point. And I apologize, it seems I have a typo here, but. Um, I'll just tie that into the next section, which is accreditation standards. Uh, so not only are we the contact for many participant complaints, but we also have a role in resolving and reporting participant complaints. So once a participant reaches out to us with a complaint or a concern, we generally reach out to the principal investigator on the study to try to resolve that. If we cannot resolve a participant complaint, we must report it to our accreditors. Um, and so, Gosh, I um, I apologize about this typo. We so the the main piece there is that we have to report those complaints as unresolved, and that can jeopardize the status of our human research protection program as an accredited program if we do not um, if we have a high level of complaints that we are unable to indicate are resolved. Now, one way of resolving a participant complaint is indeed reaching the conclusion that the participant is reaching out with a complaint that is not uh, that is without a solid basis. So that is, if a fraudulent respondent reaches out to us to say that they were not compensated for their uh, participation in your study, but we have established that they did not respond in good faith or they failed attention checks as outlined in the informed consent documentation or something like that, then we can mark that as resolved. If we have a lot of unresolved complaints, uh, the accreditors are going to want to visit with us about why that may be. Finally, there are institutional concerns at play with being able to correctly identify and manage fraudulent responders to your survey or your online data collection effort. Shockingly, it is not just surveys that this, uh, this befalls. Um, 
Inaccurate or untimely payment decisions can impact USU's reputation in communities and platforms where online data collection occurs. Uh, so for those of you who have used Amazon Mechanical Turk, you may be aware that there is a Turker community, um, a community of people who perform human intelligence tasks, where they talk about the reputability of researchers and other um, requesters who post work to Amazon Mechanical Turk. And there have been times when Utah State University has appeared on those platforms as an untrustworthy or um, an unreliable payment source. And in large part, when we've dug into that, that has been because of fraudulent responses, but it's been because of issues that we haven't known about and so haven't been able to rectify. But uh, we do, we definitely do not want a participants having a bad experience of um, participating in research coming out of Utah State University, uh, but. B, we also don't want future research that's being done by USU researchers to be impacted by a single study where um, things simply weren't planned out such that we could satisfy everybody's concerns. Uh, the institution also has, you know, interest in making sure that its resources are being used effectively. And so if there are uh, tons of automatic payments to fraudulent respondents, um, or if survey platforms are being compromised in their integrity because of fraudulent respondents, that's a concern for USU that it also needs to manage. And then, of course, the quality and trustworthiness of the research produced. Public trust in the research enterprise is, I think, a hugely important piece of how institutional research is going to be valued and communicated by the public moving forward. And um, if results coming out of USU are able to be attacked on the basis of respondents not being able to be real or results not being able to be replicated, um, that's a concern for USU. It's not necessarily an IRB concern, although the Human Research Protections Office does ethics as well as compliance. And so we, in our roles here in my office, Part of it is to ensure that institutional needs are, are being met and attended to in the course of reviewing a human subjects research study. And so these pieces do feed in to the work that we do. Okay, here's a broad overview of uh, the spaces where we will spend most of the rest of our time. I will, I have reserved time at the end for questions and answers. And for those of you that joined a little bit late, um, two of my co-hosts were not able to make it today. And so we'll probably be more like an hour instead of an hour and a half today. Um, so let's jump right into um, protecting your data collection efforts from fraudulent responders. We'll spend some time talking about deterrence, ways to even to deter fraudsters from even accessing your research. Not always possible. So we'll talk about ways of preventing them access to your research directly. So they may learn about the opportunity. They may see some information about it. But um, ideally, there are ways to prevent them from moving through the research process. And so we'll talk about some tools that you can use to prevent them from engaging in the project if you couldn't deter them from accessing it in the first place. We'll talk about ways to detect um, fraudulent responses and fraudsters. Um, it's not always possible to be entirely successful with deterrence and prevention. So once they make it in, it's important that we be able to detect them and then ways to identify and remove those fraudulent responses uh, and doing so in ways that comport with IRB requirements and institutional requirements while still protecting the integrity of your research. Let's talk a little bit about deterrence. Um, here are some ways that we can uh, deter fraudsters from even encountering your online-based research opportunity. Um, both of USU's approved online data collection platforms, that is Qualtrics and Redcap, allow for single-use links. That is a link that can be used only one time by one person responding to an email address or other contact point that they have shared with you um, where the invite was sent. This is an especially effective tool if you already know who your respondents will be. Think, for example, um, you are wanting to conduct an online survey among people who have accessed a clinical resource here at Utah State University or an educational resource here at Utah State University. I have a list of people who have already done that thing that I'm interested in, and so I know who I want to contact. I can use tools in Qualtrics and in REDCap to ensure that only those people receive that opportunity and I can even make sure that they can come back to it if they need to do it in more than one sitting while ensuring that still only that respondent on that machine and on that browser can access my online um, 
research approach. I gave the example of a survey, but of course it's broader than just surveys online. Targeted recruitment is another way. Um, so online data collection efforts that are shared exclusively with individuals or organizations uh, are unlikely to be approached and attacked by fraudsters. Um, many of the detection tools that find these projects online they don't have access to the type of sharing that we're contemplating here. So think, uh, for example, you're interested in reaching out to Utah parents of school-aged children, K-12 to aged children. You could ask schools to distribute your um, recruitment opportunity to their listservs. Uh, and you can send that along with explicit instructions not to have people share it on their personal or social media networks. And in that way, the types of sort of crawlers and searchers that are um, looking for these opportunities with the intent of defrauding uh, for primarily compensation wouldn't even come across your opportunity. Identity verification is another way, and I do want to acknowledge that there are times the IRB is not going to allow you to use this because of the sensitivity of the information that you're collecting and the need to protect anonymity or confidentiality for your participants. Um, or a particularly sensitive topic. I recall at one time um, having a conversation with somebody who was conducting research among um, survivors of domestic violence, and they, they were interested in gaining access to driver's licenses in order to uh, verify that the people were who they said they were and that they weren't just attempting to gain compensation. But Utah has a law that um, allows for address redirection for survivors of domestic violence. And so some of the data that would have been on the driver's license wouldn't have even matched up with some of the data provided in a survey, specifically because of some state level protections for this population. And so that's an example where identity verification would not be appropriate. But in general, identity verification here are um, ways that you can obtain identifiable information about your respondents in order to verify that they are who they say they are. And so uh, they're available where, say, your data collection effort is not particularly sensitive or where you're not using an online setting that prohibits that. Qualtrics panels, for example, Amazon Mechanical Turk, Prolific, Sentiment, all of these platforms prohibit you from ever obtaining identifiable information via their platform um, through, through their platform. So you could not um, make use of an identif identity verification process if, say, you were posting a human intelligence task to Amazon Mechanical Turk. You would be violating Amazon Mechanical Turk's terms of service. And I want to make clear that I said Qualtrics panels, and that is a specific thing. That does not mean that you cannot use Qualtrics for identity verification. It means that if you are contracting with Qualtrics to obtain a panel of research participants to respond to your survey opportunity, you cannot collect identifiers through that mechanism. However, you can collect information via Qualtrics that identifies a participant and allows you to be certain that they are who they say they are, as long as you're not doing that through um, through a panel. Another way you might do that, you know, uploading a photo of mail with a name and partial address, um, uploading a photo of ID where that is appropriate, uh, or perhaps with some information like a driver's license number covered or redacted, um, having the individual upload a screenshot of the invitation that they received to participate if you're able to do that targeted uh, recruitment process. Using mailers with individualized links and QR codes where you can uh, link a QR code back to a code that you instruct a participant to put into the survey and ensure that those two things match on the back end. Those are all ways of performing identity verification um, such that if you tell a participant, a potential respondent, that you're going to do those things and they know they can't meet it, they're going to opt out of your survey or your online data collection effort. Um, compensation approaches are another way of deterring this. Most fraudsters are not in this for the sheer joy of ruining your scientific research. They are looking for easy ways to compile small amounts of money at scale. And so you can limit the extent to which your recruitment materials mention or emphasize compensation, for example, such that even if your opportunity makes it across a fraudster's radar, meh, it's not clear that they are going to get anything out of doing this. And so they will move on to a more vulnerable opportunity. And um, other ways, you know, you can simply limit the extent to which you emphasize your compensation. Um, so rather than saying something like each respondent will receive a $10 gift card, you can say compensation is available. Uh, if your online data collection effort is taking place in a locale where lotteries are permitted, not Utah, 
uh, you can emphasize that there's only a chance at compensation rather than a definite compensation promise. Uh, that will deter many people from engaging with your work if they're only in it for the purpose of quickly completing it to obtain a small amount of money. Um, I do want to take a moment here to say that in Utah, chance drawings are considered gambling and gambling is illegal. However, if you have a provision in your plans to uh, to welcome all comers, regardless of their participation in the research opportunity, you can still use drawings. The key is that the only way into the drawing cannot be in exchange for something. Um, and so essentially what that looks like is if I have a drawing available in my research for compensation, say I'm gonna have 10 $40 gift cards given out to you know my 200 participants. Um, I, if somebody contacts me because they learn about my study and they say, hey, I want in your drawing and I don't want to participate, I do have to enter them into the drawing in to be in um, compliance with Utah state law on gambling. However, I do want to assure you, I've been in this role for over nine years now. I have only ever heard of one instance of this happening. I don't want to promise that every person this has ever happened to has come forward to me and told me that it happened so that I could help them sort of manage it. But uh, I do think it is very infrequent. And just for context, we receive something, you know, between 700 and 1,000 new submissions every year. So one time of that happening that I'm aware of in the last nine years of my being with this office. So I don't want to discourage you from using drawings. I just want to make sure that you understand the rules around those pieces before um, you decide to use a compensation approach that might deter a fraudster. And then the last piece here um, is using your informed consent process to communicate about um, how you will be working to detect and remove and ultimately not compensate fraudulent responses. If you have um, very clearly communicated methods of doing this, fraudsters are unlikely to engage in your survey. It won't deter bots. Bots are not reading your informed consent document and they are not opting out um, because you might detect them. However, um, it may influence careless respondents or people who intend to deceive away from your data collection efforts. Uh, many fraudsters are, I, I wanna take a note, take a moment here and say, many fraudsters are quite sophisticated. So they know that if it's academic research, complaining to an IRB is likely to result in their being paid if there was no mention of what you would do to eliminate responses up front. Uh, I receive a shocking number of participant complaints here in this office where I have been able to demonstrate that the response was fraudulent or it otherwise didn't comport with the requirements for participation. Uh, and so we've told them, thank you for reaching out. However, we've identified that you simply didn't meet the criteria for payment. And, you know, here are the specific examples. Please let me know if, uh, if you feel differently and you can provide some, you know, documentation of your perspective on this. And only once have I ever had a participant sort of push back on that. And then I went to great lengths to find out that they actually were still a fraudulent participant. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about that story in, in just a moment, but it's an interesting one. Uh, so anyway, um, using your informed consent process and your protocol process to be upfront about the steps that you will take under certain circumstances is a really excellent way to make sure that, well, to deter, and then we'll talk a little bit more about identification and removal as well. First, I wanted to show you two places given um, USU materials where you would communicate something like this. So in every informed consent template that we make available, we have this uh, screenshot from this top paragraph um, that said, that asks you as the researcher to consider and identify the circumstances under which you would call a participant inattentive or fraudulent such that they should not be compensated. Um, and so here's just some template language, although you're welcome to communicate that in whatever way you desire. Uh, we just provide some template language so that it's hopefully helpful to you in thinking about how to frame that information as you're communicating with your prospective participants. And then within your protocol itself, um, you'll want to list the circumstances under which you would terminate a participant from your study and how you'll effectuate that, um, that termination. And you should note that if a circumstance is not listed here, then you should not terminate a participant from your study, except as required to keep them safe uh, or others safe. 
And so typically fraudulent responses are not a space where um, safety comes into play. And so being sure that you you really think through what it would look like for you to identify a fraud a fraudster in your online data collection effort and saying those things up front makes your life easier. I want to be clear that doesn't mean that you can't remove them on the back end, uh, but you will have to talk to us a little bit to do that. We would love to empower you to do it on your own if you're able to use the informed consent and your protocol to discuss the circumstances under which you would do such things. Otherwise, we will help you through that process and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like at the end. Okay, moving on to prevention. Uh, one way to, um, or sorry, this, that's just, here we go. Detection is what we want. Um, IP address requirements, personal identifiers, specific instructions, ballot box stuffing. These are all ways to, um, sorry, actually, I do want to go back to prevention. I apologize. Um, so more on prevention. Multi-step screening is a really effective way to, um, to prevent people from engaging in the substance of your study. So uh, this can look like I have a screening instrument. That screening instrument is tied to my inclusion and exclusion criteria. My inclusion and exclusion criteria talk about fraudulent responses. And so I have a couple of tests wherein I'm going to make sure that somebody who ultimately engages with my data collection effort uh, is the person that they say they are and meets the criteria they say they meet. So my first screening instrument tied to those inclusion and exclusion criteria identify certain areas there and they submit that screener and they are promised a follow-up. So rather than screening and directly entering a study, there's some follow-up communication from the research team. And that gives the research team an opportunity to um, verify that the person is who they say they are. So the follow-up should of course occur in a timely manner and it should be designed to permit you to identify a real interested person on the other end of that. Think a phone call. Um, an email exchange where you make sure that the person is communicating with you in the manner that you would expect given your inclusion criteria. Uh, it could be two surveys separated in time, asking the same questions to ensure that they match the first round of responses that were your screening criteria. Um, if you design those in a way that a real participant would have a very easy time answering, but a fake participant would have a difficult time answering, that can be a really effective screening tool. Here's an example. You have a Qualtrics survey screener and you're going to collect information about eligibility and you have multiple eligibility criteria. You can tell the participants that in two days, they will receive a follow-up questionnaire from the research team. One example, uh, one I saw recently from a researcher in the College of Education and Human Services was, uh, in what city and state were you born? If your inclusion criteria specifies a particular residence requirement and you have somebody list a city and state, a fraudster is unlikely to recall what fake data they gave you initially, especially separated by time. And that time separation itself is likely um, to prevent, but it also allows you to um, detect, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, there are digital tools for doing this sort of thing. Nearly all reputable data collection platforms allow you to use things like CAPTCHA or reCAPTCHA, those little things where sometimes it just spins and then verifies you uh, if it's the newest version of reCAPTCHA. Old versions of reCAPTCHA are like, you know, here are the nine tiles, click all of the ones that involve fire hydrants. You can work quite a few, you can work those into almost every um, really sophisticated and reputable survey platform. Uh, and those are really helpful tools to um, prevent a bot or a fraudster from moving beyond that initial sort of screen and interaction. Um, for Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, an option would be use master Turk workers. Um, master Turk workers are people who have met certain requirements over a span of time of your choosing or over a number of tasks of your choosing. And you can say, for example, you only want workers with a 98% work approval rating over at least 1,500 tasks in the last two years to be able to engage with your task. It does cost a little bit more uh, and it may, may take a little more time to gather your data. Uh, and I'm talking like days instead of hours. I'm not talking like months instead of days, um, but it's a relatively cheap and effective way to manage your respondents. 
Uh, IP address requirements. Qualtrics allows you to limit IP addresses among your respondents. It permits you to say that you only want people from certain areas. Um, and that can get tricky. You, you definitely want to be careful about where you use that because I might be a resident of Utah and I might be on vacation in Virginia when I receive your um, your survey opportunity. But if you communicate that up front, not only do I want you to be a resident of Utah, but I also want you to physically be in Utah before you engage with this data collection activity. Um, that's a way that you can prevent uh, fraudsters. Now, of course, there are VPNs and other nefarious ways of getting around it, but it's one tool in a toolbox for prevention. Ballot box stuffing is another way to both prevent and identify fraudulent responses. Uh, Qualtrics and RedCap have features that place cookies in individuals' browsers um, whenever they engage with an online survey effort. And so even with anonymous responding enabled, you can ensure that participants don't overwhelm your data collection effort with responses from the same browser. Again, sophisticated users are going to be able to do this. They know to clear cookies, they know to use different browsers, and that can certainly get around this. Um, but it does prevent some, some relatively low level fraud, uh, especially for folks who are like, oh yeah, I just want that five bucks. Um, I'm gonna come take this survey, who might be local, but they don't do this all the time. Um, Qualtrics has a feature called Relevant ID that provides an overall fraud score for a given response. So it's not really a prevention tool, except insofar as when you communicate that you're using it, sophisticated users are going to know what that means and they may just opt out of the um, effort altogether. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I do have a resources slide where I link to uh, some of the, the resources in terms of like how to enable these things in your survey or your online data collection effort. And so this, the Qualtrics relevant ID is also one of those things that I linked to. So if you're interested in utilizing that, there are step-by-step -step instructions for how to do that. Okay, detection. IP address requirements and ballot box stuffing again, they're both prevention measures if you communicate them, but they are also, um, detection. So once you're once you have your data collection effort online and moving, um, though especially in Qualtrics, they allow you to uh, identify potentially fraudulent responses. So perhaps you don't use IP address limiting, but you do check the general area where an IP address comes from as your data roll in. Uh, that would allow you to detect a potentially fraudulent response within your data. Um, and so same with ballot box stuffing. Um, Qualtrics doesn't automatically discard those responses, but they do allow you, they flag them and allow you to review them once they roll in the door. Um, let's see, the Qualtrics relevant ID. If you've enabled this feature, it gives an overall fraud score to any given response in your data set. It flags the ones with high scores. Uh, the relevant ID feature calculates this by assessing things like the location of the respondent, the response time, similarity in previous responses, use of cookies, and other browser features that are likely to identify fraudsters. In combination with reCAPTCHA in Qualtrics, this feature is highly likely to identify a fraudulent response. However, it must be enabled in Qualtrics before your data collection effort. It cannot be retroactively applied. So this needs to be something that you um, make live prior to publishing any survey in Qualtrics if you want to use it. Um, again, telling people that you're using these features uh, is a helpful prevention mechanism, but you do need to enable it in order to make sure that you can actually detect fraudulent responses that might come in the door. And then, um, you know, personal identifiers. We talked about identity verification as a deterrent earlier, um, but it can also be used as a detection tool. Here's an example of a way I might still anonymously get personal identifiers to um, identify a potentially fraudulent respondent. If you ask somebody throughout your anonymous survey effort to create a unique identifier that is unique to them and with data, full data that only they know in a multi-step screening process or throughout your data collection effort, um, then you would be able to, in many cases, identify a fraudulent respondent. Here's an example. Uh, before I start screening people, I'm going to ask them to use the first two letters of their favorite high school teacher's last name, the first two numbers of their street address, the last two letters of their favorite color, 
and a two-digit day of birth for them. So if my favorite high school teacher's last name was Smith, and I live at 1092 Aspen Drive, my favorite color is teal, and I was born on the 9th of August, my code would be SM10AL09. If I cannot repeat that at the end of a screening activity or at the end of a respondent, that would be a high indicator of somebody engaging in your online data collection effort um, inattentively or with intent to simply collect compensation without providing honest responses. Um, I, you know, if I'm looking at adults, my favorite high school teacher is unlikely to change over time. I'm not really still interacting with that person. Um, my address is unlikely to change, though, of course, if you have a very long longitudinal study planned, you might want to shy away from things like that. Uh, my favorite color is generally unlikely to change. And uh, my day of birth, I'm unaware of any way that I can change that about myself. And so keeping those relatively static elements without directly requesting them, um, or enough to be identifying from the person and allowing them to create that code at the front and back end would allow you to ensure that those things match up. And if you're a sophisticated user of something like Voltrix or Redcap, you can even have settings that just flags ones where they, where they don't meet. And so you don't have to crawl through and compare two columns. You can simply ask Voltrix to identify those responses for you. Uh, of course, a highly motivated fraudster. So somebody who's like intentionally looking to sabotage your particular survey activity may still be able to engage in this way. Um, but again, these are all tools in a toolbox and I don't think that anyone standing alone would be effective. And so hopefully I'm giving you enough tools that you feel confident you can work through um, your data collection effort without something like this happening. Um, I have specific instructions here, often referred to as attention checks. So telling respondents to do a certain thing in your instrument. This is the most common, and it's certainly very easy to dupe. But again, one tool in the toolbox. So you can have an item that says, select the number six on this sliding scale, or write the words fully present in this free text field, or select strongly agree among these you know, predetermined options. Those are all really, they're called honeypots in the... Um, the online survey lingo, but they are ways to mostly help prevent careless respondents, not necessarily fraudulent responders. Finally, we'll talk about removal. Um, response pattern. So I want to say frequent data review, the one in the top, uh, top right, is a tool that you really should be using in conjunction with lots of these other tools. So um, frequent data review allows you to detect things like weird response patterns. Say, for example, I've had a survey that has been live and posted for three weeks now, and I've got 40 total participants. And then overnight, I get 100 participants. Um, that is something I, I want to be looking at my data often in order to identify that that occurred so that I can pause my instrument, perhaps, see where that um, effort may have come from or what kind of communication may have occurred that got my survey effort into the hands of bots or fraudulent responders. Um, and then be able to address that, uh, perhaps change a link, perhaps send a new email to participants asking them not to share broadly your survey opportunity. But reviewing your data frequently as it's coming in the door allows you to identify those patterns and, um, and put a pause or a stop to the sort of thing that might be causing a hundred responses at three o'clock in the morning on a single night when to, you know two weeks has only yielded 40 up to date. Um, you may look at IP addresses in those response patterns as well. Um, and then one other thing you might want to do is follow-up contact. So if again, your survey data are not uh, super sensitive such that anonymity is a, is a very important part of your ethical review infrastructure, you may want to have a provision for following up with participants to see um, whether they actually did engage with your survey, and then you can compensate. And so this follow-up is the story that I, I mentioned earlier, and I'll, I'll just briefly give you an example of one that I think was particularly egregious. It was an online survey that was supposed to be an interview follow-up. So the person participated in the online survey, and then they did an interview follow-up, but they refused to turn on camera. They did not have a name listed in, uh, you know, in the Zoom name where it typically says a participant's name. And they were giving very brief and in some cases nonsensical responses, but there was a real live person on the other end of it. And so 
At the end, the researcher determined that they did not want to pay this person, but they hadn't contemplated fraud in advance because it's really uncommon in an interview setting, but apparently this is a thing we now need to plan for. So uh, in that case, some of the data that were collected had to do with uh, addresses and parcels where people were living, had to do with um, a specific aspect of living in Utah. And so I was working with this researcher and I'm aware that you can go on the GIS for any county in the state of Utah and you can identify a parcel and you can identify an owner. So I looked at the address that they provided in the survey. I looked at the GIS to identify that parcel. I looked up the people who lived there to see if I could identify how to get in touch with them. And I found this poor, poor woman uh, in her job at work. And I called her and I was like, hey, did you recently participate in a study where you did this online survey and participated in this interview? Uh, and she's like, no, I definitely did not. I said, does anyone in your house meet the inclusion criteria um, for this study such that they may have participated. And she's like, absolutely not. No one in my household meets those criteria. And frankly, that was the only way we were able to identify that that was a fraudulent respondent because otherwise the people did know what they'd said. They did participate in the interview. Uh, they had document, they had their informed consent documentation, but they did not live at that address. And so we were able to identify that response as fraudulent and uh, close out that particular participant complaint. So they can be very sophisticated. And uh, so thinking around, frankly, your worst case scenario for someone defrauding your uh, data collection effort is um, something that would behoove you on the back end when you're sorting through your data. And then Qualtrics does have a separate bot detection tool. So it's not the same thing as the recaption. It's not the same thing as the relevant ID, um, but it allows it to automatically flag responses that Qualtrics believes comes from bots. Again, they are only flagged. They are not eliminated from your data set. So it allows you to do a careful manual review. But if you're enabling that feature and setting those parameters ahead of time, very easy to remove those folks from your data set and communicate that they will not be compensated and why. If you have planned for bots and fraudulent responses in your data collection effort, then you receive some we recommend reporting it to our office, though it is not required. If you are acting according to the terms of your approved protocol, you do not need to report anything to us. Um, it's nice for us to know because we do, again, often receive participant complaints uh, regarding fraudulent or inaccurate or inattentive responses. So if we know that you've identified some, it just makes it easier for us to communicate with anyone who may reach out to us with a complaint or a concern about their participation in your study. If you have not planned for bots and fraudulent responses and it happens, you do need to report it to our office before you can remove them. This is because whether valid or not, uh, you almost certainly made a commitment regarding compensation or um, at least an approval rating on something like Amazon, Amazon Mechanical Turk before they engaged with your survey. And um, it would be inappropriate without IRB oversight to remove those folks. So uh, we, our job is to ensure that commitments to participants are honored. And so we will work with you to identify, remove, and document the justification for removal of fraudulent participants. We are not going to assume that every email re we receive is from a legitimate participant who gave full effort in good faith in participating in your study. In fact, I will say the vast majority of complaints like that that I receive, we are able to document a fraudulent response and move on. Um, but if it's not contemplated in your protocol, before you do it, you do have to communicate with us. And so a reportable events form is the easiest way to do that. Um, if it's already happened, if you've already gotten approved protocol and now you want to go amend it to contemplate these things, please feel free to do that. And then again, you would not need to report to us, though it is nice so that we can effectively communicate with any complainants about that. Um, but we will, please know that we will help you to uh, identify and remove those fraudulent responses and to make sure that if somebody reaches out to us, they understand why it is that their response is not being appropriately credited. Uh, in the resources slide, which is next, I have a link to this form as well so that you don't have to try to write it down or save it or anything like that. Uh, here are some resources that you may find useful. Uh, in May, Qualtrics is having its annual summit in Salt Lake City. And in addition to just being one of those like big industry party things, which it certainly is, um, they do have a training session that precedes the main conference that I've attended once. 
and I've sent some of my staff to in the past. It is so very useful in terms of really getting to know the ins and outs of what Qualtrics is capable of and how it can be a real tool in um, preventing, identifying, and removing fraudulent responses in your online data collection effort if you use Qualtrics. Um, I have a link to the knowledge base article on using some of these fraud detection tools that I've talked about. The Office of Research last year bought the fraud detection package to help prevent these sorts of things from happening. And so this article walks you through the steps that you will need to enable those features in your research. I uh, have links to our informed consent templates, which again contain prompts for um, helping you communicate to participants and, about how you will be working to identify and prevent this sort of thing so that it's not a surprise if they don't get paid. Um, a link to our reportable events form that I visited with you about on the last slide. Um, I have the link to USU Legal Affairs because we have run into, I've, I've heard of instances where um, fraudulent responses have been accurately identified and um, removed from the data set, but you, have con you, the researcher, have contracted with Qualtrics or Prolific or Sentiment for a certain number of responses meeting certain criteria, and then Qualtrics or Sentiment or Prolific are reluctant to get additional participants because they don't agree that the participants were fraudulent. Um, legal affairs can be a very useful tool if you run into that kind of situation because you've paid for a certain quality of effort um, and legal affairs can be helpful if the company that you're working with is not, uh, not meeting those standards. And then finally, I have a link to our Ask the IRB Slack. Uh, this is our Slack channel that we monitor from eight to five. Um, the only time we don't is when we are in office wide meetings, so we may not get to you during during those times. Um, but it's I mean, think of it as a live chat. Uh, we, we're here, we're paying attention to it during the hours of eight and five when the university is open. And so feel free to use that resource to get in touch with us about um, really anything. Um, but certainly if you have questions about fraudulent responses or bot detection, you can utilize that space. So moving on to Q&A, um, I see that I have two questions in the Q&A. So let's uh, check those out. Regarding compensation, would a good deterrent be to say that there is no monetary compensation for participation in this study? If it is true that there is no compensation, yes, that would be a highly effective deterrent. Again, most people are not engaging with efforts at this level because they want to ruin your research. They're doing it to obtain the compensation. And so if your study does not have compensation, that would be appropriate. If your study does have compensation, we probably would not allow you to say something like that simply because the recruitment process is the start of the informed consent process. It's the first time participants are learning relevant information about possible participation in your study. And so we wouldn't want that to be deceptive, uh, but we have allowed many people to simply be silent on the topic of compensation in their recruitment process so as to avoid or deter people from interfacing. You do have to be upfront about compensation in your informed consent process. That um, without a waiver or an alteration, that is something that you would need to include in your informed consent process, however. Um, can I repeat what forms of identity verification are permitted? So <clears throat> I do wanna say, uh, any good human research protections professional is going to start most answers with, it depends. And uh, this is a case where it depends. So forms of identification of identity verification that are appropriate are highly dependent on the content and structure of your study. So um, if, for example, it is very important to you that you not obtain participant identifiers, screening through identity verification is not going to be an appropriate tool for you. However, if you are going to know your participant pool or say you are um, interfacing with unknown set of people who may participate in your research and the topic is non-sensitive, that's a space where identity verification is absolutely appropriate. Um, and I will send these slides along with the notes to the registrants, but I do have a few um, examples listed there. Um, so one way of identity verification is, you know, provide a, a photo of a piece of mail, provide a screenshot of the invitation that you received to participate in this study. Um, those are certainly options. Or you know, having an interim phone call, somebody fills out a screener and then they have a phone call where if something seems fishy or off, that's a space where you can identify that person's identity, 
maybe not their direct identity, but you're engaging in some effort to ensure that they are who they say they are. You might ask them questions about their eligibility criteria. You might do something like what city and state were you born in across two separate times? All of those are fact ways to um, engage in identity verification. Are we allowed to gather IP information in Qualtrics if we are collecting anonymous data? We do not, generally speaking, think of an IP address as an identifier. We would consider a MAC address an identifier. That is an, um, an identifier that is unique to a particular machine. But generally, IP addresses, generally, IP addresses are not identifiable. If I respond to a survey from my office here on campus, nobody would have any idea that that was me. Um, I share the same IP address as the 23 other hundred other participants, or I'm um, sorry, employees on this campus and the 17,000 students who are engaging from this campus. So if you told me that you were targeting USU students or faculty and you wanted to collect IP addresses, I would say, great, go for it. Um, if you told me that you were engaging rural communities with very specific demographics, such that if you had an IP address, you would probably pretty easily with any other information be able to identify a person, that would be a place where it wouldn't be appropriate. Um, so again, it depends on the context of, of your study, your inclusion criteria, and what it, what else it is you're collecting about them. Um, but you did say anonymous data. And so yes, there are certainly times when anonymous data collection can indeed include a collection of an IP address. How and when do you suggest communicating to prospective or potential participants that you're using those? Uh, very strongly recommend doing that in your informed consent process. If you don't wanna do it in your informed consent process, a note at the start of your online data collection effort indicating that you are using those tools would be appropriate. I recommend the informed consent process specifically because um, <clears throat> some of these tools I'm mentioning are not considered the most uh, privacy forward tools. And so I think it is important for people to understand what it is that's being gathered about them before they start to engage. And so, um, you know, things like the response ID is using information about my browser to determine whether, um, sorry, relevant ID. They're using information about my browser to determine whether I'm a real person and whether I've done this 80 times already. Uh, and so, I think an informed consent process is an appropriate place to communicate that you're using tools like that. It gives a privacy concerned participant an opportunity to look up that feature and decide whether that's something they want to continue to engage with. Um, what topics are not sensitive? Oh, so much work that we see done at USU is not sensitive. So um, information on like educational strategies and people's preference for that. Um, we see a lot of work out of NR and civil engineering and sociology about um, how public officials engage in decisions about water use or you know other natural resource usage, and so that's that's a space where like you're engaging public officials and you're asking them about how they make decisions in their official capacities. That would be considered um, unsensitive. There are, yeah, we I, I'm sort of struggling because it is so broad. We we do see a lot of surveys that are really not asking about sensitive data at all. Um, you know, what kind of food do you like? What do you, there's an ongoing survey effort, as I understand, I think I just saw something on Instagram about like your perceptions of the Student Nutrition Access Center as a, as a non-user. And so your perceptions about snack uh, is not something that we would generally consider to be sensitive. So yeah, examples like that, and, and we see them every day. Uh, I mentioned collecting a driver's license for ID verification and interested in this option. When would it be okay to implement something like this? This would be appropriate where, for example, um, you are obtaining information about somebody that would already contain that sort of thing. So uh, here's an example. <clears throat> if I am wanting to uh, do a very intensive study with folks who have accessed the psychology community clinic, and I'm going to be asking them for their, uh, for their records, um, I might only be engaging with them online, but identity verification there really wouldn't get you any more information about that person than you're already planning to get when they agree to participate in your study. So that's a space where something like getting a driver's license would be easy peasy. Uh, in general, 
I'm probably not going to say get full driver's license information, right? So you'll want to you'll want to instruct participants to cover or redact or you know do certain things just to get you enough information. Frankly, if you're working with like a student population, something like a student ID would definitely be a better bet there. Or um, you know, I'm a lawyer, so uh, you want a picture of my bar card, for example. My name and my bar number are public information. You can go and look that up. Uh, and so there's really no problem with me providing that sort of thing. However, where you're not already collecting the information or where you're not going to be collecting the type of information that you're wanting to engage with, I would say generally something like a driver's license to identify a person is probably not appropriate. You might want to revert to something like um, creating their own unique code out of sort of relatively static pieces of data about them that would allow you to link on either end. Um, and so an anonymous survey data collection effort, uh, that's not a space where a, a driver's license or something like that would be appropriate. That's all the questions I'm uh, I'm seeing. So uh, I will just again share that um, we do have one more training coming up April 8th, Collecting Data on Children in Schools. You'll be able to register for that beginning tomorrow on the homepage of our website. Um, and again, these will have links. So, but irb.usu.edu is our homepage, and that's a pretty easy space to access. Um, and again, we would love to hear from you what you'd like to talk about for trainings for the fall semester. So if you have any ideas or things you're wondering about that you'd like to hear from us on, uh, please do submit that. It would be so very helpful instead of us uh, hoping that we're targeting what it is you'd like to hear from us. Um, I'll take a moment to check for any other questions that may have come in. And I don't see any, so I will thank you all for your time and wish you a lovely day. <laughs>